It's so great to be here. How many of you were at uh, OzCon a couple years back when we announced 1.0? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like amazing how this community's changed. And so um, I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, Kubernetes is just the most amazing uh, journey I've, you know, technical journey I've seen in my life. And I think it's been as a result of this unique fusion of three things. Right? What we've seen is a community evolve, this incredibly strong, technically grounded, smart community that is invested in the same set of things. And that's been very powerful. The second thing we've seen is a set of end users start to emerge and actually be part of that community, really make the technology their own, be a part of it, build their business around it. And then the third piece has been the vendor ecosystem, organizations that are willing to make huge strategic bets in this technology. Now, when I put this presentation together, I wasn't looking to tell you what Kubernetes is going to look like in a year's time. The community is going to figure that out, right? Like, that's not, that's not my job. But what I was thinking about a lot was how do we as a community, what can we do that's really strategic to make sure it comes together well? And this is largely grounded in what I've seen over the last year as a startup guy. I used to, I used to come up here and say, hey, I'm a product guy, and I'm a startup guy. Um, and these thing, three things are really obvious, but when you start pulling them together, it really tells a story about how important it is to hold Kubernetes together, how important a number of attributes of Kubernetes are, and I'd like to just sort of tell the story for you. Um, the first point here is developer productivity really matters, and I have developed such a strong sense of this over the last year when working with some of the larger organizations. Um, I'm also starting to see this deep legitimacy around multi-cloud. I always used to kind of like nod and smile when people said multi-cloud. I never really believed it. Um, I'm starting to see it for reals now. And having spent a little bit of time with some of the world's larger technology companies, I can tell you firsthand, enterprise is complicated. And these three things brought together actually create some really interesting opportunities for the ecosystem, some interesting challenges, and it's something I want to talk through. So let's start with the first one. Developer productivity matters. We work with some organizations that hire tens of thousands of developers. Tens of thousands, right? And some of these developers you know, spend their life uh, writing code, and some of them spend their life waiting 90 days for a virtual machine to be provisioned. It's not a great experience. Anything we can do, even a 5% improvement in developer productivity will have disproportional impact on those organizations. When you think about it, technology is changing the world. Technology is driving every business. What's driving technology? It's developers. And Kubernetes has been the seed crystal to this new way of getting development running forwards, getting code into production. And we tend to think about it a lot from, as a, a sort of a developer framework. And one of the things that I've really observed and I want to think about as, as we move this forwards is it's not just about development. It's really about operations. At the end of the day, the thing that's holding those developers back is the operations team. It's the operational drag. It's the thing that is constantly gating their ability to produce and deliver great code. And so when you start thinking about you know, what has been driving developer productivity, particularly with that operations lens, it's this idea of moving from static code to living services. And nothing embodies this more than the cloud, right? When you think about the cloud, everything in the cloud is something as a service. So software as a service, Kubernetes as a service, uh, infrastructure as a service. And what that means is I'm going to take a technology, whatever that technology is that I plan to deliver as a service, I'm going to wrap it up with a provisioning and integration API so that instead of me having to uh, worry about uh, filing a ticket, I can actually get an API to provision it for me. And then bundling a really powerful and capable operations team around it. When you go to Amazon, when you go to Azure, when you go to Google, you're not just buying basic infrastructure. You're not just buying access to an open source technology. You're buying SRE, right? You're buying an operations team that's going to deal with this for you. And there's nothing stopping you from bringing those practices into your own organization. There's nothing stopping you from developing this incredibly rich way of thinking about delivering your software not just as static dead things that you throw over the wall at the business every 90 days, 
but as a living service with an expert operations team that is delivered to the entirety of your organization. That is really powerful. When you start making this step, a lot of great things start to happen. You can start looking at uh, a world where, you know, I speak to so many of these organizations today that are living in the world of virtual machines and traditional infrastructure, and they talk about resiliency. It's like, you know, enterprise is about resiliency. It's about how long does it take to these things uh, before they go down. You know, that's that's, that's going to impact my business. And I look at them and I always say, like, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You should be focusing on recoverability. How long does it take you to get it back up when it goes down, right? There's, there's a lot of different ways you can cut three nines. That could be one second every thousand seconds where no one even notices an interruption in service. It could be an entire business day once every three years where everyone really notices it. That's the type of thing that really focusing on these sort of operational practices will get you. The relentless focus on automation, you know, removing toil out of the day-to-day -day life of an organization. Getting to a point where your operations team is creating a gate, a back pressure on your developers. Doing things like SLA budgeting. All of this is possible, and Kubernetes really is the seed crystal for this. It starts to deliver a framework where you can tease apart these various concerns, right? Now, this here gives us a way to start thinking about, and let's just start on the right there with the, the cloud world. You can look at the stack where organizations have started to create these expert operations functions and tease apart different services. So you have one team that's racking and stacking VMs and delivering it as a service where you can request it with an API. It's called infrastructure service. Thank goodness that every major cloud provider out there is now delivering Kubernetes in the same way. And it's kind of creating this Goldilocks abstraction where you actually have a pretty harmonized story above it. You have the cloud, service, the cloud services that you know, exist you know, potentially in the future. Who knows? Maybe they'll be running on Kubernetes. I suspect they probably will be in a lot of cases. Uh, or you can actually get a fully packaged application you know, in, the, in the form of SaaS. So that's, that's the world of cloud. Now, you can do all of this yourself as well. Like, why wouldn't you? If you're a massive enterprise, you could run an infrastructure operations team and have a dedicated you know, set of organizations. You could introduce Kubernetes as this Goldilocks abstraction that creates a very clean abstraction above it. You could take a lot of your services and deliver them in the same model, the same metaphor as the cloud providers are delivering. Uh, and you could create um, you know, entire applications that are run that same way. The separation of concerns is very powerful. You get the same efficiencies that the cloud providers do. Or you can mix and match. You can say, hey, you know what? I'm just going to use the cloud provider's Kubernetes as a service, but I'm still going to start thinking about creating my own service operations teams. This becomes very powerful. But to really light it up, you start to need to have a set of common policies that span across these areas, right? If you're starting to mix and match, I want to use my infrastructure and a cloud provider's infrastructure, and we use Kubernetes as a subtraction zone, I still probably have security and governance policy that needs to exist. You need to think about that. And in many ways, that's why Kubernetes is so powerful. Like, you could draw that line across that cluster ops area, and you can get a perfectly harmonized solution that works well in both those environments, and then you know, create commonality above it so you can flexibly pick where things run. With that in mind, um, it's worth mentioning that multi-cloud is really happening. And this is kind of one of the key ingredients that I think is really driving multi-cloud. And for multi-cloud to happen, um, we really need strong conformance, right? So I have to take a moment to congratulate every one of the major cloud providers out there who have introduced Kubernetes as a service offerings, right? It's not just Kubernetes as a service offerings. They've introduced upstream-friendly Kubernetes as a service offerings. That's a very powerful thing. And part of the reason that we can feel good about that is that we're getting into a situation where it doesn't matter who is delivering the Kubernetes. It doesn't matter how it is operated. It doesn't matter how it is provisioned. The thing that matters is how it runs. And for us to get to a point where we have high levels of assurance that Kubernetes is working exactly as it should, conformance really matters. We need to have the ability to attest that these clusters are semantically consistent, that they have the same behavior. And uh, you know, for that, this is why the uh, CNCF um, uh, certified Kubernetes program is so important. When you see that Kubernetes logo on someone's offering, you can have a relatively high degree of assurance that it's working as it should. And this leads us to some really good places. Um, it makes hybrid cloud real, right? Now you can say, hey, I'm going to run something on-prem, and it could be something I construct myself, it could be something from one of the distro providers, and I'm going to have uh, something that's running in my public cloud that's delivered by my favorite container as a service or Kubernetes as a service uh, provider. 
Now, how would I make sure that these things are semantically consistent? How would I be able to say that, hey, when I'm using my development tools, they're gonna be able to focus on both these environments? The answer is you need to run the same test in both places, right? You need to be able to certify your on-prem piece. So this is why we've been working with the community to create a technology like Sonoboy, so you can actually package up and run these technologies and make sure that you're getting that semantic consistency across both of these environments. Now, how do we take that one step further and get multi-cloud to be real? Well, multi-cloud is interesting. Like, I don't think about multi-cloud as being, hey, I want to take this application and I literally want to run it in two clouds. I mean, there are some applications where you can. If you're in a bank and you're running these big old Markovian uh, processes that are largely stateless and just have um, long you know, compute runtime cycles, yes, it works great. If you're Bitcoin mining, it works great. If you're doing anything that has massive amounts of data, like nothing creates gravity or inertia like data, right? And then when you start to pull in service dependencies, that's also gonna kind of hold you back. So you, you have to be judicious about that. Like multi-cloud, to me, means having the flexibility to pick which cloud I wanna deploy my new service into. It means being able to say, hey, I would like to run uh, this in different regions, and I have my data sharded out by those regions, and I can pick different cloud providers to make those sense of those regions. But to really get there, we need to get to a point where we have not just you know, this attested, stable narrative where everything is working all these other, in these areas, but you can also start to extend your governance, risk management, compliance, policy and security enforcement across all of those with a common abstraction across the top of them. And that's why extensibility is gonna become so important. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. You know, this is one of the things that we were working on with our friends at Microsoft. So, um, you know, Brendan and that crew are good friends of ours. And we've been looking at ways to help them you know, inside the uh, Azure Kubernetes service. And one of the examples of that was, hey, backup restore is hard, right? Like, let's make sure that we have a great solution for that. And so they've been working with us to make sure that the Arc um, technology provides a great um, backup recovery solution for them. But being able to take your cluster state actually gives you a line on, on multi-cloud that I think is gonna be really exciting as we look to the future. Like, this technology enables you to not just, you know, take your cluster state and back it up and restore it there, but potentially restore it somewhere else. Now, we're not there yet on the persistent uh, volumes. You, we, there's a whole bunch of work that will need to be done to make sure that that's real. But you can see the promise of this as a way to start moving things around inside clouds, you know, directly. So inside something like Microsoft's cloud or potentially between clouds or from on-prem to cloud. And Kubernetes is the key to that whole thing. Now, Ken did a great job of talking about this um, earlier, and I think there's a couple of reasons why extensibility is so important, right? Um, enterprise is complicated. When you start working with a really big organization, you know, from our perspective, and this is just a message to the community um, for folks that are sort of early on the journey, I'm sure the people that are late in the journey already have experienced this in, in buckets, there's a lot of unique needs, right? If you're deploying a Kubernetes cluster into an air-gapped environment, there are a lot of unique needs. If you're working with a regulated environment, there are a lot of unique needs. And it's difficult for one organization, one vendor, one person to meet all of those needs. So for us to succeed as a community, we need to really think through where are those key uh, extensibility points? You know, like how do we make sure that Kubernetes remains extensible and open? And there's been so much great work that's been delivered by the community um, over the last um, couple of uh, months, even, um, in terms of extensibility. But there's a lot more work that still needs to be done. You know, we need to start thinking about how to formalize a lot of the interfaces that exist and how to make sure that our conformance frameworks allow for these lines of extensibility. Because when we get to that world, when we start thinking about you know, where this is all going, you know, how to start reasoning about Kubernetes across the multi-cloud verse, when we start thinking about, hey, we have um, different requirements for different workloads. You know, I'm doing, when I'm serving web traffic, I might have some relatively gnarly requirements around ingress and, and traffic shaping and load balancing. Uh, when I'm running certain production workloads, maybe I want to add my own you know, custom logging frameworks or monitoring uh, capabilities. I might have a CI CD framework that I've built out that you know, works across potentially other environments too, not just Kubernetes. Um, and then I might need some security uh, capabilities. Now, like, security is a great example. Like, look at what Kubernetes is doing for security and think about the power that that brings, right? Like, you look at the work that Aqua and Stackrocks and Twistlock are doing in the security space. 
When you think about that increased line of visibility that containers provide, uh, there's some really cool stuff you can do. You know, you're now in a world where you have line of sight with um, the, the container abstraction that you can see every Linux syscall there. You have line of sight if you deploy something like Istio or a service mesh into what's talking to what. You can have a very strong sense of observed security exploits rather than um, you know, having to kind of harden at the image level. And when you think about Kubernetes as a control plane, you have an immediate source of remediation where you can start to just cut things off and you know, shut them down. There's an amazing amount of innovation that we're gonna start to see in, 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 a, in a place just like the security domain. Like, and I, I'm, I feel safe saying this, I have no um, horse in the security race right now like, as, a, as a vendor. I'm just delighted to see the work that's being done there. But for those organizations to be able to bring value to the community, it's critical that they can plug into the environment that users are providing. Not just that on-prem environment or that you know, bespoke environment or that environment that organizations are running themselves, but into AKS, into EKS, into GKE. And so the formalization of these sorts of interfaces, the formalization of extensibility, the introduction of that into the conformance framework itself is going to enable you, the end user, to get access to all kinds of awesome, wonderful things that are being delivered in this open community. And it's going to enable these organizations to innovate uh, and, and not be tied into a single provider. And I think, you know, when I look to the kind of, you know, the future, this coming year, this to me stands out as one of the key things. And, um, you know, I for one am really proud to be part of this community. It's been such, a, such an amazing journey. And I think that if we just hold together, there's so much more that we can do. You know, Kubernetes is still very, in a, you know, it's very much in its infancy. Uh, we're still at a point where we haven't felt the full potential of it, not just as a way to solve some long-standing issues around the deployment and management of software, but as a way to build new classes of distributed systems where Kubernetes is the core development environment, where it effectively emerges as the kernel for this new, uh, for this new world. And to do that, you know, we really need to solve the operations problems. Like, it's not about zero ops. Anyone who says zero ops is selling something. It's about ops power tools, like ops specialization, getting developers out of the operational game, getting the SREs into it, right? It's about conformance. Like, we currently have less than 30% of the formal APIs, stable APIs, covered by the Kubernetes conformance test, right? If we want this vision to be real, we as a community need to put a whole bunch more resources into formalizing that. Not just the APIs that you use on a day-to-day -day basis to run your applications, but the APIs that you use to actually integrate these extensible mechanisms that are creating massive value for you in the cross-cloud world. And we need to rally around that. And, uh, you know, we need to formalize our extensibility. And I'm so excited by some of the stuff I'm seeing. You know, there's, there's been so much work that's been announced recently and great work that's been done. And so I'd like to close this out with, you know, a statement I made a couple years ago at um, OzCon when we launched CNCF and we announced Kubernetes 1.0. Think about Jevons' paradox. And this is really a message to, you know, everyone. Like, when, I don't know, how many of you are familiar with Jevons' paradox? I've even heard of it. Okay, so Jevons' paradox is this kind of economic theory where when you massively decrease the cost of something, um, well, sorry, when you massively increase the efficiency of something, you expect to see demand go down. Things are going to consume less of it, right? You increase the efficiency of, of coal engines, people expected to see coal consumption go down. It actually went completely the other way. The increased efficiency created new uses of it. It created new ways to consume it. It drove the consumption of coal considerably. And when we look at what we're doing here, it feels the same to me. We're at a transition point. If we can unlock the developer productivity so that those 10, 20, 30,000 developers that are working in enterprise organizations, when those startup developers can do more work, it's gonna create disproportional increase in the amount, the quality, and the capabilities of the technology we delivered. If we can rally around conformance, it's gonna create a far more efficient environment where those developers can deliver those tools into an environment of their choice without having to rework it. And as a result, they will be producing more and they will be consuming more and they will be driving the success of this community more effectively. And if we can formalize the extensibility and make sure that Kubernetes remains an open and, and accessible framework, where we're not moving back into the world of mainframes, where IBM's now called Amazon and uh, you know, whatever the, the case may be, where 
where they are providing you know, a lot of value and then organizations can bring more value and actually solve problems, we're gonna see a much more efficient community. So thank you so much, it's been great chatting to you.